Okay. So I will uh, cover the second part of the urinary tract infection, essentially looking at pyelonephritis and recurrent urinary tract part. Uh, we uh, know UTI is a broadly used term and it encompasses a lot of uh, uh, parts of the kidney urinary tract where infection occurs, like the bladder urethra, the bladder itself is called a cystitis, urethritis for the urethra. When it involves the kidney, it is known as pyelonephritis and it can also involve the ureter. So I'm going to talk essentially about pyelonephritis and recurrent urinary tract infections. We, uh, the normal genital urinary tract has a lot of defense mechanisms to prevent against infection. The normal flora prevents growth of the wild other bacteria. Uh, the unobstructed urine flow allows uh, the bacteria to be flushed out. Acidic urine prevents urine uh, uh, to grow, uh, bacteria to grow in the urine. Certain proteins and inflammatory cells also prevent infection in the urinary tract. The uroepithelium is resistant to bacterial infections and certain chemical chemokines and immunoglobulins in the prostate also prevent infections in the urinary tract. So despite that, we do get infections and uh, infections are in the urinary tract are either complicated or uncomplicated. Complicated UTI is infection which occurs in patients with an obstruction in the genital urinary tract or an abnormality in the genital urinary tract. The obstruction or abnormality can be either a functional or a structural abnormality, and that predisposes to infections. An uncomplicated UTI occurs in patients, especially women, where the genital urinary tract is normal, and the most common infection in that category is a cystitis or infection of the urinary bladder. However, it is worth noting that any infection in a male should always be taken as complicated till you proactively rule out any abnormality in the tract either functional or uh, anatomical. So let's move on to a case of acute non-obstructive pyelonephritis. So this was a 54 year female. She was uncontrolled diabetic. She presented with dysuria, left flank pain, high grade fever, and urine showed plenty of pus cells. A uh, screening sonography showed normal kidneys and perinephric fat stranding of the left kidney. So before we go forth with the case, quickly looking at the epidemiology of pyelonephritis. Pyelonephritis or infection of the kidney is less common than infection of the bladders. The highest incidence is in young women between 20 to 30 and almost 20% of non-pregnant women need hospitalization for this infection. It can manifest with a severe septic shock. Uh, it is uncommon, but it can come up with that. It complicates one to 2% of pregnancies and commonly occurs at the end of the second trimester or early in the third trimester. And it is rarely a cause of renal failure. The way to diagnose is, uh, uh, this infection is the presence of pain in the flanks or costovertebral angle pain or tenderness. It is accompanied by fever and lower urinary tract symptoms like urgency, precipitancy, or uh, severe burning sensation when passing urine. It could also be associated with high fever, nausea, vomiting, and pain. A urine culture would most likely diagnose the bacteria and the susceptible antibiotic. And as discussed by Dr. Rajesh Kumar, also more than 95% of women with pyelonephritis, uh, a colony count of 10 to 5 or more are isolated from the urine culture. And uh, they, some of these, almost 10 to 25% of these patients will also have the bacteria in the blood which represents a severe form of infection of pyelonephritis. Uh, when we look at diagnosing with an imaging, ultrasonography is often the initial modality because it is safe and accessible. Ultrasonography though is less sensitive or specific for pyelonephritis compared to either a CT or MRI scan. And when do you decide to do ultrasonography is when the presentation is very severe or there is a recurrence after treatment of similar infection or once you think that the treatment has failed. So you want to rule out if there is an obstruction or unfunctional cause of recurrence of infection. Treatment typically would involve these drugs and I wouldn't go into the details of the drugs. We all know these are the commonly used drugs as first line therapies and this is an alternative therapy that can be used. When do we need to hospitalize these patients? Uh, if they are pregnant, they may need hospitalization. If there is a severe septic shock with hemodynamic instability, if there is a gastrointestinal absorption issue, or patient could be non-compliant with oral therapy. If there is a complication like an obstruction or an abscess, or they have comorbidities that need concom concomitant monitoring or treatment. 
then it would be worth hospitalizing these patients. Uh, after hospitalization, you may need any of these IV antibiotics for treatment of this infection. So going back to this case, uh, this patient underwent a urine culture and appropriate antibiotics were given. Her sugars needed control, so they were tightly controlled with insulin. She was given an idea about toilet hygiene, and we'll talk about that in the recurrent UTI part. She had a stiff constipation, and she was told to avoid constipation because gut translocation of constipated bacteria into urinary tract can happen. And she was asked to drink plenty of liquids, which essentially works kind of a flushing mechanism to flush out bacteria and not to hold urine for too long. Uh, so this is how we treated this case. Going to complicated UTI, where there is either a functional or an anatomical obstruction expected in such cases. So this was a 60-year-old male with hypertension and a heart disease who presented with dysuria, urgency, hesitancy, precipitancy. He had fever with a raised creatinine and the urine showed pus cells of 40 to 50. And ultrasonography showed both kidneys were normal size with mild dilatation of the pelvic elation system. There was a trabeculated bladder and a prostate hypertrophy of median low, and there is a post void residue of 70 cc. So looking at complicated UTI, that is a frequent cause of hospitalization in, uh, in infections of the genital urinary tract. Most common cause of almost 10% of ICU admissions with septic shock are because of the genital urinary tract infections. These patients also have a tendency or they are at risk for local complications like a renal abscess, perinephric abscess, or the infection could spread through the blood and cause septic arthritis, osteomyelitis, or endocarditis. And serious complications are more frequent in patients who are diabetic, immunocompromised, or have a chronic urological device or obstruction of the urinary tract. The most common abnormalities that are associated with complicated UTI are categorized as such here. So obstruction could be PU junction obstruction, ureter or urethral strictures or prostate hypertrophy or a stone or a tumor or an extrinsic compression. A functional obstruction with a neurogenic bladder where the bladder is not able to uh, pass or throw out the urine. Sometimes there are indwelling devices like a stent or a nephrostomy tube or a Foley's catheter or urological abnormalities like vesicular ureteral reflux or bladder diverticulums or cystoceles or ileal chondrites. Sometimes metabolic diseases like nephrocalcinosis, medullary sponge kidneys, uh, urethral valves can cause uh, infections. And immunological uh, suppression in renal transplantation could also lead to infections. E. coli remains the most commonly isolated organism in such patients. And other enterobacteria like Klebsiella, Citrobacter, Proteus, Providentia, etc. are also found. Gram-negative organisms like Pseudomonas, Acinetobacter are also seen. So is gram-positive organisms like Enterococcus and Coagulus negatively, negative staph. Not to forget the fungal infections like Candida can be commonly isolated, isolated from patients with diabetes or those with indwelling catheters or patients who have been receiving prolonged broad-spectrum antimicrobial anti therapies. The principles of treatment in such complicated UTI remains are uh, promptly collect sample, identify the species and get a sensitivity. You have to characterize the renal function and underlying abnormality. You have to institute appropriate therapy, hemodynamic stabilization as required, but most importantly also try to treat the underlying cause which led to infection. So in our cases, we did all of this. We gave an appropriate, anti appropriate antibiotic, but eventually this patient also needed TURP for the prostate. And this was done and he did not end up having more infections in the future. Now coming to recurrent UTI, uh, let's talk of a case first and go into the details of it. 65-year-old female postmenopausal non-diabetic came with history of recurrent every UTI every three to four months. Ultrasonography showed normal kidneys and bladder. She had history of straining for urine since last one year. A uroflowmetry done outside was showing that her flow rate of urine was moderate to poor and there was intermittent flow pattern noted. So when you have a recurrent UTI, it is essential to know whether this is a reinfection or a relapse. Reinfection means that UTI recurs after entry of a different organism into the genital urinary tract. So you get an infection with E. coli, maybe next time it is a Klebsiella, then it is a Cereacea, that is a fungus. So that is called as reinfection. Whereas relapse means UTI in which the same organism persists in the genital urinary tract 
despite antimicrobial therapy, which means you had a E. coli UTI and next time you do uh, infection comes, you check it's again E. coli, it's again an E. coli. So that is more likely a relapse. Acute uncomplicated UTI recurs frequently and is characteristically a reinfection, not a relapse. As many as 30% of early reinfections are within the one month of treatment of an episode and E. coli or similar organisms, E. coli are the most common ones to cause it. One of the reasons of that is either failure of the antibiotics to eliminate the organism and there is possibly a persistence of E. coli in the uroepithelial cells uh, due to which it escapes the antibiotic therapy uh, eradication. Uh, most commonly, uh, it is seen in women recurrent UTI and some predisposing factors include genetic reasons where there is a non-secretor of the ABH blood group antigens or in young sexually active women, uh, most commonly post-sexual uh, intercourse or use of spermicidal jellies which will cause or change the local flora or a UTI at a prior younger age is a risk factor for recurrent UTI in future. Now, this is a normal anatomy in a female and a male where you can see a urethra is short in a female. This is the bladder, whereas a urethra is quite long in a male. A small urethra and a close proximity to the anal, anal opening also causes higher risk of infection compared to male where the urethra is far away from the anal opening plus it's a long urethra. Sometimes some conditions like cystocele where the bladder sags down will lead to some residual urine retention here. Like here where the bladder is completely going to empty, here the bladder will sag down and there is retention and this kind of uh, conditions will predispose to bacterial growth and recurrent urine infection. So short urethra compared to male, shorter distance between anus and urethra, cystocele's postmenopausal vaginal atrophy, prolonged holding of urine due to a lot of toilet access. These are one of the few of the various causes of recurrent UTI in females. Uh, recurrent UTI is defined as more than two infections in six months or more than three infections in one year. And like I discussed, the risk factors include genetic causes, behavioral like spermicide, diaphragms, anatomical causes and postmenopausal causes. And uh, it can happen post void as well. Males also can rarely get recurrent UTI, but it can happen if there is an intercourse with a female partner with recurrent infections, or if they're not circumcised, or if they have an anal intercourse. Diagnosis, obviously urine culture is not recommended routinely for women, except uh, when, if the clinical presentation is not characteristic, or if they don't respond to appropriate therapy, or infection occurs in less than one month with a resistance strain. Treatment options as are on the screen, not dwelling too much into that. Uh, the therapy is essentially the same. You look for culture, you start an empirical therapy. If previous cultures are available, you look for an appropriate uh, antibiotic empirically for that. You use parenteral IV antibiotics for patients who are hemodynamically unstable, who cannot tolerate oral infections, or who have no choice because the oral drugs are resistant. And uh, if a patient comes with a septic shock, you provide both a gram positive and a gram negative coverage, which would include a higher spectrum antibiotics as mentioned here. Other uh, interventions would be to look for obstruction or abscess and ensure that they are drained. You may need to do a spleen X-ray or a CT scan to identify stones or an emphysema adverse pyelonephritis or other conditions like an abscess. If there are chronic indwelling catheters, then those should be removed so that the infection is uh, treated faster and there is a lower risk of relapse, early relapse after therapy. And urological investigations like cystoscopy, retrograde pyelography, or urinary dynamic studies should be done as appropriate. What is not helpful is a different catheter material or antimicrobial coating of catheters or antiseptic at meatal meatus or insulating antiseptics in the drainage pack or use of prophylactic antibiotics. So back to the case, this patient ended up having multiple reasons for recurrent infection. She had atrophic vaginitis due to postmenopausal state which needed with treatment with estrogen screen. She had a cystocele with a uterine prolapse. She was asked to do Kegels exercise and eventually she was recommended to get a surgical treatment for the same. 
She also had, uh, if you remember, a poor flow and intermittent pattern of urine passage. So cystoscopy was done that showed a meatal stenosis, urethral stenosis, and a cystodilatation was done. And eventually, a year into follow-up, this patient is still doing well without a recurrence of infection. And quickly, just prevention of UTI, last slide, uh, some tips. Please empty the bladder fully when urinating. Always urinate after sexual intercourse to prevent post-coital infections. Wipe from front to back to prevent fecal flora from entering the urethra. Drink plenty of water. Cranberry juice is supposed to help. Apparently, there is definitely not no harm unless you are taking warfarin. Avoid use of diaphragms and spermicides because they will uh, damage the local natural flora. Avoid irritation of the vagina with feminine hygiene products. Use lactobacillus probiotics in such difficult cases. Do not delay urinating when the need arises. In post-warm menopausal women, if they have atrophic vaginitis, use topical estrogens and use antibiotics in case of recurrent infections, either post or post-coital, or if it is continuous when there is a prolonged recurrent infection, you use that as a prophylaxis. So I will end my talk and uh, back to... Amit, you rushed through your earlier slides, which were important, and you still have four minutes to go. Oh, I'm so, so sorry. I... So that was that was part of the treatment uh, protocol, which was probably important from the family physician's point of view. So if you can utilize your four minutes. Sure. So for this... Yeah, basically the treatment and, I mean, the practical things this which one. the family physicians face. No, this one, this ones. One. Treatment part, I think you skip for want of time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. This one. Yes. 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 So, so complicated duty. I like I said. Even before that, what was your drugs of choice and things? Okay. Like okay. That. Yeah. So the drugs of choice generally would be, if they're possible to use, the commonest drugs that we use in first line therapies are either the septron, the nitrofurantine, or the phosphomycin single doses, which is a uh, new uh, entry into the market off late. The alternative commonly used drug uh, in general practice are the ciprofloxacin groups, the uh, amoxicillin clavulonic acid, especially for the gram-positive enterococcus group, or the cephalax cephalosporin group uh, like cephalaxin, cefuroxim, cefixims. And if you have to use long-term low-dose for prophylaxis, then nitrofurantine and septra can be used. Cephalaxin also can be used as a prophylaxis drug along with norfloxacin, ciprofloxacin, or only trimethoprim can also be used. For postcoital recurrent UTIs, single dose treatment with septra can be used. You can use a nitrofuratin single dose, you can use a ciprofloxacin low dose single dose, you can use a cephalaxin or a norfloxacin. But the most important for postcoital is also for a female to ensure that she voids immediately after the post-coital uh, time. Do not wait for too long. That helps prevent ascending infection. And this is probably one slide for recurrent UTI, which I think uh, incorporates most of what are the behavioral changes and do's, proactive do's that you can uh, imply uh, or use in your clinical practice. So that